Today we're going to hear from our prosecuting attorney, John Thunheim, and a project that he's been working on. I'm going to tell you a little bit about him. A lot of you know him, but a lot of you don't, so I'm going to give you a little bio here. On he earned his uh, degree at the University of Puget Sound School of Law. While in school, he joined the Thurston County Prosecuting Attorney's Office as a legal intern, and upon admission to the Washington Bar Association, he was hired as a deputy prosecuting attorney. And he served that office in that capacity through 2010. That's when he, uh, per oh, he personally prosecuted hundreds of criminal cases, specializing in cases involving sexual assault and domestic violence and crimes against children. He was a leader in the effort to create Monarch Children's Justice and Re uh, Advocacy Center, which is an organization providing coordinated services to child victims of abuse and neglect. Well, he served on the Government Lawyer Bar Association from 2007 to 2009. He currently serves on the Paralegal Advisory Board for South Puget Sound Community College and is president of the Washington State Association of Drug Court Professionals. Last year, uh, Governor Inslee appointed him to the Washington State Sentencing Guidelines Commission. He's a graduate of Leadership Thurston County, now serves on its Board of Regents. He serves on the board of the United Way of Thurston County and previously the boards of the Child Care Action Council, Big Brothers, Big Sisters, and Family Support Center. He's also been a member of, well, he is a member of the West Olympia Rotary Club since uh, 2004. He's a Paul Harris Fellow, and he's chair of the West Olympia um, Charities Fund. For his community work, he was named 21st Century Leader by the Olympian received a Champion for Kids Award in 2008, and the Making a Difference in the Life of a Child Award in 2009. 2011, he was honored as a local hero by the Washington State Bar Association, and in 2012, named Law Lawyer of the Year by the Thurston County Bar Association. Most recently, he was named Champion for Washington Kids by the organization which is called Fight Crime, Invest in Kids. And John, married to his wife for 29 years, and they have four kids. So let's welcome Prosecuting Attorney John Tunheim. Well, thank you, everybody, and I appreciate the opportunity to come and talk to you about something that has very basically absolutely nothing to do with prosecution. I. Uh, uh, I've been here a few times before as your program, and each time I've been here, I've talked about something that was going on in criminal justice and tried to update you on some of the innovative things that we're trying to do in the criminal justice system. But today I'm here to talk about something that uh, I think um, uh, is kind of foundational to uh, us as human beings and as a society, and that is hope. Now let me ask a couple of questions. Uh, any, was anybody here at the district conference that was at the Red Lion uh, earlier this year? Okay, a few of you. So I apologize in advance because this is very similar to the, I was a keynote speaker at that uh, conference talking about hope um, because uh, uh, again, I was, uh, I was invited to come talk about this as a theme because it's so fundamental to what I think we as Rotarians uh, are about. Um, and I've been giving this presentation in various forms throughout the community. So if you have heard it before, I apologize. But you know, they say it takes three times to really learn something. So, um, you know, if you're on your third time, you're bound to walk away and knowing uh, all about this now. My, one of my chief deputies, Christy Peters, who's here with me t today, is probably, this is about the fifth reiteration uh, that she's heard. So if I actually, I'm unable to finish this, she could probably get up and finish it for me, uh, which would be just fine. I'm going to kind of move through this fairly quickly. Um, this is one of those presentations where I can kind of expand or contract uh, to whatever time frame I have, and there's lots of things to talk about. So uh, I'm going to move through it rather quickly, and hopefully I can uh, get through it to the point where maybe there's uh, a few questions or we can have, engage a little bit uh, at the end with some questions. This is 
I, I hope you find it to be a fascinating topic. And I'll make sure the my technology is working, and it is. All right. So uh, this is a quote from the book The Hunger Games, if you don't recognize it, and later the movie The Hunger Games. Uh, it's really one of the themes throughout The Hunger Games. If you go Google this quote, you get hits uh, like crazy because it's become a rather um, uh, uh, well-known quote from that series of books. The idea that hope is the only thing stronger than fear. One of the things that got me interested in hope theory is the fact that there's there's really scientific validity to this statement, which is what I'm uh, really going to talk about today. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about fear first, just so that you understand what I mean when I talk about hope is stronger than fear. Uh, how many of you have heard of the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study? I, I think I've actually talked about it a little bit uh, uh, in prior occasions when I've been here to speak, because it became very interesting to us in criminal justice uh, looking at the relationship between kids who experience trauma and then later in life involvement with criminal justice, uh, with lots of health care issues and all kinds of other adverse outcomes. This pyramid that you see here is a pyramid that was developed by one of the leading researchers in childhood trauma that basically attempts to try to give you conceptually uh, how each of these things build on each other. So when a child experiences childhood, adverse childhood experiences, or what I would just simply call trauma, from that uh, is built all of these other um, adverse outcomes. Higher rates of disease, uh, more likelihood of uh, committing crimes and, and going to jail, all of those things, and then ultimately a higher rate of mortality. Um, people die sooner as a result of having experienced uh, trauma early in life. So uh, I've been interested in this topic for a number of years, basically since I was elected prosecuting attorney and first uh, heard about this at a drug court uh, professionals uh, conference, this study. And there's been a lot of activity in this community about this very study. Um, uh, and if you've heard of Thurston Thrives, one of the major pieces of Thurston Thrives health initiative is built on this particular study. And what it's talking about is how do we help kids overcome this idea, the, this trauma? What, what is it we can do with kids to build resilience? And then about, fear, uh, about three years ago, I was at a domestic violence uh, conference and went to a lecture on trauma, trauma-informed care. Uh, but it turned out to be something completely different than what I was expecting. The lecture was by a hope theorist from the University of Oklahoma. Uh, who's now become a good friend of mine, and we uh, exchange information frequently about hope theory. Um, and as I was listening to that presentation, uh, I came to realize just how important this research was uh, to um, everything that we've been talking about in terms of childhood trauma. And in fact, that was also his interest as well. Hope theory, um, so I guess, uh, just to be clear, when we talk about that word hope, we use that a lot in everyday language, right? Uh, all the way, it ranges from things like, gosh, um, I hope it doesn't rain today, to you know, talking about our hopes and dreams for the future, and everything in between. Whenever you hear that word hope, automatically what you know is the speaker is talking about the future in some way or another, right? Because that word is really about the future. So for a moment, what I need you to do is kind of set aside the, the common usage of the word hope and bear with me to a very specific uh, definition and framework that we call hope theory, okay? So hope theory um, is a scientifically based research, uh, a body of research that comes out of um, a, um, uh, uh, an area called positive psychology. This was a group of psychologists who uh, really got tired of always trying to look at what was wrong with people and diagnose people and figure out their pathology, right? Instead, what they decided to do is, let's look at what's right with people. Let's look at those things that really promote health and happiness and people's ability to thrive and to succeed. And let's figure out what those things are. And so they started this body of research called positive uh, psychology, looking at all different positive aspects of human 
that the human experience things like uh, courage and grit and and then among those was this idea of hope and as they started looking at hope more and more and more what happened was hope started to rise to the top as one of those things that pre best predicted a person's ability to thrive and succeed many of the hope theorists now that it uh, theorists now uh, really believe that it is probably one of the if not the leading uh, predictor of a person's ability to thrive and succeed in life that's why I think it's become so important it but it has a very specific definition now as I said when you use that word hope it automatically provokes you to be thinking about the future and at the essence of hope theory is in fact that fundamental idea that uh, hope is a is about the belief that the future can be better than the present or the past and that we have the ability to influence that and to make it so. That's kind of the, the, the core definition of hope as I'm using it today, right? The belief that the future can be better than the present or the past and that we have the ability to influence it and make it so, okay? Uh, and so uh, psychologists uh, defining it that way uh, have built a tool. They can measure it. If I wanted to, I could have you take a, a very quick little uh, survey and it would give you a hope score. It would measure your level of hope. And uh, interestingly enough, this research now is, you know, is going into its third decade. This has been going on for 20 years. They've done thousands and thousands and thousands of hope surveys. And this tool has been validated over and over and over again in the various studies that has been used. Uh, and so it's, co it's considered uh, scientifically reliable uh, really without any doubt at this point. That w was to me what was so interesting about hope theory because I've had people say to me you can't measure hope and to which now I firmly disagree. In fact you can measure hope and we've, um, and we've proven that. When you break hope down into its element it's got three basic elements that are very important to understanding what hope theory is. The first is a vision for the future that includes very specific goals. Okay. When you well, hope theory, in essence, when you boil it down, is really just a, a goal setting framework. It, it illustrates the importance of having goals uh, as a person, as an organization, as a community, uh, and, and, and then how you take those goals and move forward with them. So, the first thing is you've got to have a goal, right? But that's not enough, um, because the second part that hope theory uh, talks about is the fact that there needs to be a pathway to that goal. The person not only has to have the goal, but actually see a pathway to achieving that, and have a strategy in mind to achieve that goal. A goal without a pathway is a wish, right? That's what researchers would say. A goal without a pathway is a wish. It's not a goal. A goal with a pathway is moving towards hope. The third thing is uh, the willpower to want to pursue that goal and to move forward towards that goal. Uh, the researchers call that agency. Okay, uh, that that word is is kind of referred to as the willpower to apply energy consistently to achieve that goal. So when I say hope now, instantly the way that you need to be thinking about that is those three words: goals, pathways, agency. Those are the three basic elements of hope theory. So um, for a moment then, let's talk about hopelessness. Somebody who does not have hope, and what does that look like? Now, if I said, what do you think the opposite of hope, of hope is, without, not hopelessness, obviously, but it, how would you describe the opposite of hope? Just anybody. Despair. Despair. That's the number one answer I get when I answer that question. And you know what? It's right, partially. Despair is on the way to uh, hopelessness, but it's not complete hopelessness. So here's uh, what theorists have come up with as kind of the, the pathway, the, the ladder, if you will, to hopelessness. Starting with hope, uh, it first uh, moves to frustration. So think about somebody who's got a goal and they've got a pathway to that goal, but that pathway is blocked by something. There's some obstacle in their way. They can't get to the goal. The first reaction that they're gonna have is they're gonna get frustrated. And that could actually turn to rage if they continue to strive towards a goal that they can't achieve because there's something blocking uh, that goal. 
And that's the emotional reaction. Because when we're talking about agency, we're talking about an emotional investment in the goal. And so when you don't have that, when you have that investment still, but you can't get there, you get angry, you get frustrated. The next step is despair. Because now uh, you're still emotionally invested in the goal, you still want that goal, it's still desirable, it's still something that you want, but you, you're coming to the place where you believe you can't achieve it, and that turns to sadness, and then ultimately despair. But the idea is you're still emotionally invested in that goal in some form or another. The opposite of hope is actually apathy, where you get to that point where that young boy there down in the corner uh, is, where he's holding up his hand and he just says, I don't care. I don't care anymore. I don't care about the goal. I don't have a vision for the future. I just, I'm kind of here and existing. I just don't care anymore. That's the opposite of hope, okay? So when you hit the opposite of hope, how do we build people up back into uh, having hope? So this is the, 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 the ladder, if you will, building the hope. And what you start with, obviously, is a new goal or another goal. The goal is the, is the core piece of this. So the first step is setting a goal. Short term, long term, doesn't matter. Having a goal, okay? The second thing then is figuring out what are the pathways to that goal, the, the viable pathways. Now, I know a number of you probably sit on boards and committees and so forth that have done strategic planning, right? A lot of you have done that. Strategic planning is just a very formal way of building hope in an organization or in a committee. Now, how many of you have come out of a strategic planning that you thought was just very successful, and you come out of it and you feel energized, you're kind of ready to roll up your sleeves and to move forward towards this goal, whatever it is. Anybody ever felt like that before? Few people, right? So that's agency, right? As you become emotionally invested in the goal, you see viable pathways to that goal, you're excited about the goal, the agency builds, and now you're ready to apply willpower to go towards that goal or agency. That's what that is. So as you're going through this goal setting and the, and the pathway, finding the pathways, then uh, your agency naturally starts to increase. Now one thing that, uh, goal, that hope theorists say is important is establishing future memories about that goal, okay? So what ha what the what's unique about um, about the human brain is that it has the ability to store things in memory beyond just what has happened. You can store things in memory that you visualize as could be happening, right? So as you form a vision for the future for yourself and you set goals, you store those into memory and you start thinking about that. And as you move forward towards that goal, you're remembering what it looks like to achieve that goal. So it's important when you're working with, if you're working with somebody to build hope, one of the questions you ask is, what does that look like when you achieve it? Can you describe it? Can you have a vision of it? Because then they're gonna store that into memory. And then finally, uh, that builds the elements to hope. And you would, uh, on, the, on the hope tool, likely come out with a high hope score. The, one of the nice things about hope that they've discovered is that it is cyclical. So once you have built hope, it builds on itself because now you set a new goal or another goal and that builds more agency and more pathways and it's a cycle that continues. That is what builds resilience uh, uh, for people to move forward towards uh, various goals, okay? So um, let me just tell you a story to illustrate that. It's a personal story, but I think it's a decent illustration of that way down and that way up. Um, I, my undergraduate degree is in physics, okay? Uh, when I started college, I started uh, college with the intent to be a physicist. My father was a PhD physicist, uh, professor. Uh, I was kind of going down my father's, uh, in my father's footsteps, as they say. Um, but about two years into that, uh, really discovered that I had no passion towards physics. It was not, I, I, couldn't see a, I couldn't see a vision for myself doing it. I didn't know what it looked like, but physics was that goal, right? But uh, I very much started to lose my agency towards that goal, 
right? Because I wasn't emotionally invested anymore. I couldn't see a future in it. Uh, I was working to put myself through college. I started working more, going to class less. I got the first F in my entire life in, it was either Calc 3 or differential equations my sophomore year of college. And at that point, just had to step back. And was, was I frustrated? Well, not really. But I was getting in that point of almost apathy where it's like, you know, I, do I really want to go to school? What, is, what does this look like for me? Um, but the thing about it was uh, that uh, looking back on it now with this framework, I realized I never stopped thinking about the future. I just became discouraged of the fact that the goal that I originally had wasn't the goal that I wanted. So I started exploring. I took a class called Civil Rights and Liberties, which was a pre-law class. I became intense, intensely interested in the, the idea of going to law school. So I went to the pre-law advisor at the campus and said, I'm really interested in going to law school. What do I need to do to get to law school? And you know what he said? Finish your physics degree, right? Yeah. You're two years into that. Why start over again? If you get a physics degree, you're going to get into law school because they just want to know that you have uh, you know, taken on a tough curriculum, that you have critical thinking skills, all of those kinds of things. And so that changed something for me, right? Because the physics degree now became not the goal, but the pathway and all of a sudden agency came up so my grades popped right back up I ended up picking up minors in philosophy and political science to enhance that uh, and I was uh, considerably more motivated to, to towards school and in fact then to get into law school and you know the rest you heard about in, in the bio but to, when I learned about hope theory and, and I started thinking about my own uh, pathway uh, through college, I realized that what was happening there is I had lost hope for a moment. But then I re -gold, right? I re -gold. And, th and that was what was able to give me, get my hope back up again to move forward. The researchers have also done a lot of study on brain science and hope. Um, and the interesting thing is that um, they've done br uh, research on brain science along with the trauma as well. And what we know is that when kids experience trauma, it inhibits brain development, okay? It inhibits brain development. It actually slows kids in their ability to learn and thrive and so forth. Hope does exactly the opposite, okay? So when somebody starts thinking about the future, they developed a study where they had somebody uh, hooked up to whatever machines they do to monitor brain activity and took them through an exercise to get them to think about the future, right? And to start thinking about goals that they have and so forth. And what they noticed is the first place to light up on the brain was the memory portion because to think about the future, you've got to put it in context of the present and the past, right? So your brain actually starts in memory. And then as it forms this, this idea or this vision, of what a goal might look like. It goes through the center of the brain that controls um, prioritization and emotion. So what the brain is doing there is deciding, are you emotionally invested in this goal or not? Is this something that uh, excites you and that you can put some emotional energy in? And how much? How important is this goal to you? Okay. So the brain is starting to prioritize this against other things. And then from there, it ultimately goes toward, once the, once the brain decides, oh, this is an important goal, I'm emotionally invested in it, then it goes to the portion of the brain in the front called the prefrontal cortex, which is the executive decision-making of the brain. It's the strategic thinking part of your brain. And that's where you actually start thinking about, okay, I've got a goal, how do I get there? What's the strategy, what's the pathway? That gets there and they've actually seen the brain light up in that very specific order and then it circles back around as I said and it stores that future memory uh, it stores that vision into future memory and so you can recall it and cycle it through all right some quick things about attributes about hope that's important to know one is hope is universal it goes across culture race, ethnicity, everything, because it's fundamental to, to the human condition. The, the fundamental belief that the future can be better than the present or the past and that we have the ability to make it so. Setting goals, finding pathways, having agency, doesn't, doesn't matter what, what race, culture, gender you are, it's always there. But 
The goals may be different. The pathways may be different, okay? But the framework itself, itself remains the same. It's also important to realize that hope is not a moral process. You can have high hope people with very low moral compasses, if you will, right? I run into some of those people sometimes. <laughs> those are the people in my mind that probably do belong in the county jail or in the state prison system because they're very goal driven. But it's, it becomes very kind of, you, you gotta back away from moral evaluation when you're talking about hope theory. Uh, as I was sharing with Larry earlier, people who are drug addicted oftentimes are high hope people because they've got a goal. It's that next fix. They, they know how to get pathways to that goal. They'll do whatever it needs. They, they are high hope people. But interestingly enough, when they go clean, their hope score plummets. What it is about is trying to figure out what does the future look like when I'm clean and sober and how do I get goals to that regard. Um, it is not related to income or social status. It is not a factor of intelligence or education. It's really part of the innate human condition. And it can be taught and it can be learned. That's the difference between hope and uh, trauma theory. Trauma is what it is. Hope, you can actually teach and learn. And it's contagious. There's lots of studies on this that show that high hope people build the hope score of the people around them, okay? It's contagious. Here's, the, here's a diagram from some of the research that's been done to look at the distinction between trauma and hope. I'm, I'm getting close to the end of my time, so I'm going to just kind of barrel through this. And what this basically shows you, this drop in hope, the line that you see, that's the hope score. The ACE is the, is the trauma score. So as the trauma score increase, the hope score plummets. So we know that trauma uh, actually takes hope away, which makes sense to me. Right? The next slide here is the outcome of a study going on in California uh, with a program called Camp Hope, where they're working with kids who have experienced domestic violence in their home. And now you see this, the opposite, where before this uh, camp, they have a low hope score, but after the camp, the hope score has increased. And they're continuing to follow these kids now to see what happens even going beyond uh, time in that camp to see if the hope score continues to increase. So you can change hope scores, and that uh, would seem to predict a higher likelihood to flourish and to succeed. Uh, here's some of the outcomes, and I'm not gonna go through these in great detail, but uh, all of these outcomes that I've got on this slide are research-based outcomes. So they've been studied and proven, right? So in education, hope is a better predictor for success in college than the ACT or the SAT. Or, the, or GPA for that matter. It is the best predictor of success in law school, right? Uh, uh, even beyond the LSAT. At work, it accounts for almost an extra day a week in productivity for our people who have a higher hope score. High hope managers have higher profit businesses, almost across the board. Uh, in health, high hope people take care of themselves. They do what their doctor tells them to do. They exercise. Um, they're less susceptible to depression or to, or to post-trauma, um, uh, post-traumatic stress, um, and they live longer, exactly the opposite of trauma, right? When you look at the trauma scale. And here's a big one. Hope is, a, is one of the leading predictors of somebody's um, happiness in life. When they pull somebody and say, are you happy and satisfied with your life? And most people are oftentimes much higher hope score people. So I'm gonna wrap up with this, in terms of hope in organizations, okay? Because why, as Rotary, you're an organization built on hope. Think about those days back when uh, some folks around the table met and said, hey, we're Rotary, what are we gonna do? And somebody said, hey, let's end polio. That's a pretty big goal, right? And now look where we are, right? Because they, they said, okay, we gotta figure out the pathways, we gotta have agency, we gotta engage the organization and look where we are now, and Hope went from a small group of Chicago to an international organization, all right? So here's some ideas about hopeful organizations. Leadership in an organization needs to be hopeful. That builds hopeful organizations. You need to be goal-driven, look for pathways, and don't be afraid to re-goal if the goal becomes uh, unachievable for some reason or another. Continue to look for pathways and anticipate the barriers that might come up to those and uh, maintain that agency because motivate, motivation is contagious and be solution-oriented in the face of adversity. 
This quote by Martin Luther, I think, sums it up. Everything done in the world is done by hope. When you think about goals, pathways, agencies, makes sense, doesn't it? Thank you very much for listening today. I will talk about hope anytime, anywhere, whether it's privately or if you've got a group you want me to come talk to, just give me a call. I will come and talk to them about hope as well. All right? Thank you. Time for a couple of questions. Oh, yeah. Questions. Questions about hope theory. Man, I covered it all. Yes, ma'am. What's a theory? Oh, thank you for that. The Family Support Center downtown has now has a grant uh, to help them plan and develop a Camp Hope. So they're, I'm, the, I think their goal is to try to have Camp Hope uh, next summer, summer of 2017. If not, it would certainly be 2018. Uh, it's a summer camp model for young, uh, for children who, again, have experienced domestic violence. The curriculum of this is specifically designed to try to help kids build hope. So it's talking, it talks about goals, <laughs> pathways, agency, and, and so forth. So stay tuned for that. We're excited about it. Yes, sir. Is there any reading that would be able, we'd be able, you'd be able to recommend to us? Yes, great question. There's a book out there by a gentleman named Shane Lopez. You can get it on Amazon. It's called Making Hope Happen. Shane is one of the leading hope researchers. He works for Gallup. Um, and he's been studying and working with Hope basically his entire career. That book is written very in very lay terms, so it's a, it's a really easy read, but it's got great information about the history of Hope theory, the research, and kind of how it applies in real life. Yeah, making Hope happen. John, thank you. All right, thank you. As is our custom, we're going to ask you to sign a book that we will donate on your behalf to the South Sound Reading Foundation. You can take that down. I'll do that. This Thank is you. one of my favorite parts of coming to speak here, by the way. This is awesome. <laughs>